Hello and welcome to a brief tutorial explaining the concept of word embeddings. The main goal of this tutorial is to explain how words can be represented as vectors of real, of real valued numbers. In this vector representation, words with similar vectors should be semantically similar, that is, they have to represent related concepts. Sometimes, for practical purposes, these vectors have relatively few dimensions in the order of tens or hundreds, compared to the vocabulary size, which is usually at least tens of thousands. Here is an example of word vectors obtained using a method called GLOVE. We have projected the word vectors on their first two principal components in order to depict them. We notice words closer to each other in this space share similar attributes. For example, we capture the synonym relationship between words, here rep represented by car and auto. The antonym relationship between words is highlighted by the agree-disagree pair. Words which represent values on a scale are also sim very similar in this space. Here the cluster of words cold, warm and hot. Another type of relationship is the hyponym hypernym one or words being in a type of relationship. For example, truck is a type of car and dog is a type of pet. Words can also be co-hyponyms, that is, being a type of the same concept, but the words are not synonyms. For example, both dog and cat are a type of pet, but they're not synonyms. Also, we notice a cluster of names, which are all co-hyponyms. Finally, we notice groups of words which appear in similar contexts. For example, eat, drink and talk, listen are pairs of verbs that describe related actions. The hypothesis on which all word embeddings are based is called the distributional hypothesis and dates back over 50 years from now. Linguists such as Harris and Firth phrase this hypothesis as you shall know a word by the company it keeps or words that occur in similar contexts tend to have similar meanings. As a consequence of this hypothesis, the meaning of a word can be approximated by the set of contexts in which it occurs. The newer term describing this operation of word embeddings is thought to be equivalent to previous terms describing this idea, such as distributional semantic models, distributed representations, semantic vector spaces, or vector space models. Word embeddings can be used in a very broad range of practical applications. First, they can be used to compute similarities between words. For example, one might want to find the most similar words to happy for sentiment analysis, or to find variations in spellings of the word, word cool as used on Twitter. It can be used to create groups of related words. Word embeddings can be used as features for classifying texts into topics, such as sports or politics. They can be used to cluster documents. And finally, they're, they're useful for natural language processing research, where they are useful for a number of tasks, as they can be used, for example, to enrich statistics for lesser used word by leveraging the statistics of more highly used words. Such applications include part of speech tagging, name identity recognition, or syntactic parsing. The literature makes distinctions between two ways of approaching this problem, both of which are very related to each other. The first approach, which we name count-based, looks at, looks at counting word co-occurrences or word context occurrences. The second angle has the goal of predicting the word based on its context, building the word embedding in the process. The intuition behind the distributional hypothesis can be viewed using these examples of contexts in which the word teacher appears. We highlight in a blue a number of words that repeatedly occur in the same context and are thus representative of the semantics of the word teacher, such as education, student, class, grade, testing, or lessons. In the distributional semantics pipeline, the parent statistics from a large set of contexts are reduced to summary statistics, here row counts, for each word. Then these statistics can optionally be transformed. Here each word is represented by a vector of vocabulary length, which is likely to be sparse and contain redundant information. Using a dimensionality reduction technique, such as singular value decomposition or SVD, results in a compact and dense real-valued vector for each word. 
These vectors can be thought of representing each word in a n-dimensional Euclidean space. In this space, words that are closer to each other are more similar. In this figure, we show a toy example of four words embedded in a two-dimensional space. In this space, teacher is close to tutor, but also relatively close to school. Food, on the other hand, is far away from all other words. The word similarity measure usually used is the cosine similarity. Intuitively, this represents the angle between the vectors joining the origin to the vector representations of the word. On the other hand, prediction methods such as word to vec have a different objective. In the simplest setup, the goal is to predict the word, represented as a dense numerical vector, by using the vector of the words in its context. This prediction step is repeated across all contexts in the dataset. In the end, similar words are predicted by similar contexts. All models offer a range of parameters that need to be specified. First, the dataset used for training the model plays a vital role. Some datasets from specialized domains, such as medicine, may offer different semantics than general purpose ones, such as Wikipedia. The context size plays an important role in the similarity type obtained, with larger contexts leading to a more topical similarity, with a more restrictive context leading to semantic and syntactic similarity. Specifically, the context can be filtered to exclude frequent words or keep only certain parts of speech or dependency types. Other parameters include the counting method, the type of matrix being built in the first step, the method with which vector similarity is computed can be changed, as well as, as the dimensionality reduction technique used. Obviously, representing words as dense numerical vectors has some limitations. First, compositionality of words is harder to model. In order to obtain an embedding for a sentence, one does not obtain good results just by adding the words' vectors together. Some words have multiple senses, and these are not captured by a single vector for a word. Word embeddings may need to be tailored to a specific similarity measure to be useful to a task. For example, for sentiment analysis applications, antonymy might not be a desirable type of word similarity to be encoded. The other type of word similarity, not usually captured using word embeddings, is topical similarity. This is mostly modeled using topic models. Finally, here is the list of software packages which offer pre-computed or very easy to use implementations of different word embeddings. All of them offer tutorials that would help you get started. On the final link you can also interactively explore and compare different word embedding methods. For the interested reader, I have shortlisted a number of references. The material in these references should be accessible after listening to this tutorial. Thank you for watching.